uh, just to give you one example, the most dramatic one I know, uh, when the Pentagon Papers came out in uh, 1972 or so, uh, one or whatever, uh, I, when I read through them, I noticed one of the very dramatic fact. There were 20 years of intelligence reported there, uh, and CIA, DIA, the whole business. Uh, so the, uh, the obvious question to ask and to look for is, what did they have to say about North Vietnam's intentions? What were they up to? Well, that's interesting. Turns out there's not one paper that uh, ever raised the question whether North Vietnam might be following its own national interests and not merely following the orders of the Kremlin or China, either one would do, or the Sino-Soviet conspiracy. Actually, there's one staff paper which never went beyond being a staff paper, which raises this question. Now, you know, that's a level of ideological fanaticism which is kind of hard to imagine. I mean, whatever you think about North Vietnam, the fact that they were following their national interests is pretty obvious. Everyone knew they were nationalists. Uh, but you couldn't raise that question because even at the internal to intelligence, you had to create the misimpression that it's the Soviet Union you're fighting. In fact, if you look at the details of this, it's kind of incredible. I have. I wrote about it in a book called For Reasons of State that came out right at that time. Uh, intelligence was assigned to, when the United States decided to aid France, intelligence was essentially assigned the task of proving what had to be true, that North Vietnam was an agent of the Sino-Soviet conspiracy. It had, just had to be true. Otherwise, how come we're defending, we were defending Vietnam from somebody, it can't be from the Vietnamese, so it's got to be from the Sino-Soviet conspiracy, so therefore it's true. Well, intelligence has the task of proving it, and they tried. You know, the intelligence record shows that for a couple of years they did their work. They looked for connections and so on. They came up with a crazy, the oddest conclusion. They came up with the conclusion that of all the countries in Southeast Asia, North Vietnam seems to be the only one that doesn't have any connections to China or Russia, uh, one of the two bosses. Well, what do you do with that? Well, it's not hard. You just have to know how to be a well-trained intellectual. That proves it. Uh, the conclusion that was drawn from that was that the Russians or the Chinese or whoever run them, can, that they are so loyal and so obedient, they don't even have to send them messages. They can just <laughs> count on it and they'll do everything they want. So that was the conclusion. Well, okay, what's going to happen when you lose all this stuff? Uh, actually, there's another reason why we need the Russians. There's got to be a method for frightening the public into paying a subsidy to high technology industry. There's, there's a method by which you keep high technology industry functioning. It, you, free trade is okay for editorials, but in the real world, nobody believes it. Uh, the parts of the economy that work are the parts that are government protected and government subsidized. And the foreign economies that work are the same. And you look at American history, it's highly protectionist and so on and so forth. Well, you take a look at the American economy, there's two parts that are competitive internationally. Uh, one of them is capital intensive agriculture and the other is high technology industry. They're both government subsidized. Uh, agriculture, everybody knows. Uh, high technology industry is just the Pentagon. Uh, the government provides a market for high technology production and it provides a subsidy. Of course, that means the public provides a subsidy for research and development and so on and so forth and also a cushion for the corporate manager. You know you've got that cushion. If you can sell something in the commercial market, you do it. If you don't, the taxpayer will buy it. Uh, and therefore, that sort of functions. Well, what do we do if we lose that? I mean, how, how do you convince people to do that? Well, the Russians are coming, or you know, the Libyans are coming, or something like that. Uh, but suppose you lose that threat. Well, you've got a problem. Questions are not, in most places, part of the economics department, because they're not economic problems. And they're not part of the political science department, because that deals with, you know, electoral or politics or something. In fact, they're not part of anything, so therefore you don't study them. But they're the real problems. Uh, and what are you going to do if the Russians aren't around to uh, terrorize the population? Well, there's concern about that. In fact, the literature on this is very interesting. Uh, you look at the Sovietologists, even the, the liberal ones, like, say, Gary Ho or whatever his name is from, I think, Brookings, uh, has a recent article in which he says, we can't be too sure that the optimists are right maybe Gorbachev's methods will succeed. It's an interesting turn of phrase. In other words, the optimists think he's going to fail, but you know, you can't be sure. Uh, maybe he'll succeed, then what do we do? Uh, and in fact, that's a pretty frank way of putting it. And sorry, but this is an international economics journal, so nobody's going to read it, so keep it safe. Uh, but um, that's part of the thinking. 
Uh, actually, in the public domain, uh, one interesting indication of how people are thinking was in the last article, the New York Times at the end of every year runs a bunch of articles in which all kind of you know, wise people uh, sum up important things in the world. And their summary article on this problem was written by a guy named Dimitri Symes, who's uh, from the chief senior associate of the Carnegie Foundation for International Peace, or whatever it's called. And that was a very interesting article. I think it was December 28th in the Times. Uh, he says, and he sort of indicates that, he says that all this business going on in Russia is kind of confusing things that were simple and, you know, problems. But there's some silver linings in the cloud, uh, e even if it works. Uh, the and then he goes on to say what the silver linings are. Well, the main one, he says, is, and it's an interesting one, uh, one the two, really. Uh, well, it's actually three. One is we'll be able to shift the burdens of NATO onto our allies, so-called allies, actually our enemies, uh, Europe, uh, Europe, basically. And that's important because they're getting too big for the britches and we can make them harm their economies more and that sort of thing. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing which is more important is he says we will not be subject to manipulation by third world countries on the matter of the debt and such things. Uh, the idea is if they've got the Russians there and they can play them off against us, we can be manipulated by the undeserving poor, you know. And we won't have to worry about that if they don't have this, uh, this play that they can work with. But the most important thing, and the most interesting one, is he says, uh, this will remove the constraints on the use of military violence in the world to enforce our goals in the third world. Now that's interesting, and what he's, it's an insight of the, you know, one of the interesting things is that this Soviet business is beginning to let reality come out. The ideology is that we deter the Russians and we contain the Russians. The truth is the opposite. They deter us and they contain us. Uh, we're afraid, and he gives examples. He says, for example, in the early 70s, uh, when oil prices, he thinks, were going up too high, we couldn't invade because we were afraid it would lead to a global war in the Middle East and uh, maybe the Russians would get in and not danger. So we were deterred. But if the Russians back off, we won't be deterred anymore. We won't be contained anymore. And therefore, we can use military violence if those Arabs get the wrong idea. Uh, the second, he gives two examples. The second one's Nicaragua. He says the Sandinistas will have to think twice uh, if the Russians don't put an umbrella over them. Then we'll be able to attack them directly. We won't be deterred any longer by the threat of the thing breaking out in a nuclear war. Now, that picture, that's an interesting point. And it sort of, as I say, lifts the veil on a lot of mysticism. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a point that's repeated over and over again in the press, like the Washington Post and so on, regularly runs editorials and news columns uh, in the major press, runs things about how to prove his good intentions, you know, to show that he really has new thinking, uh, Gorbachev has to agree not to deter us in our attack against Nicaragua. That's not the words they use. Uh, the words they use is he has to stop supporting Nicaragua. Nicaragua has to disarm. The one country in Central America which is under foreign attack has to disarm. Uh, and uh, first of all, he has to stop providing them with economic aid. That will prove his good intentions. That will prove he's serious about detente. So there's a logic behind that to prove the, what we call detente is eliminating the deterrent threat that prevents us from using violence in the world wherever we want to use it. Uh, and that's the silver lining in the clouds. You know, so, we can, so even though there's problems about all this stuff, we can still make use of it somehow. I think this is all going to be a very serious business in the next couple of years, to tell you the truth. Uh, and it's too big to talk about now, but just to sketch something, I, m I think what's happening, the way it looks to me for about the last 20 years, in fact, is that the world is breaking up into three major blocks. Uh, there's a kind of a Europe, European block, that, you know, sort of around Germany, roughly, there's a yen-based block, you know, Japan and periphery, and there's a dollar block, which we just brought Canada into it as a new colony. It's called free trade. Uh, it includes whatever part of Latin America is viable. That's one of the reasons they're so worried about the debt crisis, I think. They're going to try to work out some way to get taxpayers to pay off the banks so that, uh, like they're doing with the savings and loan thing, uh, so as to get Latin America viable enough so we can bring it into our relatively closed area. And how Europe fits into, how Russia fits into all of this is going to be very tricky. Uh, 
Europe and Japan are both trying to reconstitute what amounts to more or less traditional colonial imperial relations to Russia, you know, investing, getting resources out, and so on. The Japanese want to do it. They've got plenty of capital, and there's plenty of resources in Siberia. They want to do it there. Uh, Germany is doing it uh, in Western Europe. If that happens, the United States will be a second-class power. Uh, the United States will be a, what the geopoliticians have always regarded it as, an island power off of Eurasia, which is now united. That's the nightmare of planners. Uh, and uh, how we'll react to that, I don't know. But it's just in, in the past, that's the kind of thing that led to global wars. Uh, probably it can't anymore because countries are too interdependent and there's too much flow of international capital and just weapons are too destructive. But how you're going to handle that situation, I think, is very unclear. That's probably going to be a major problem in the, in the future. So I think that question points to major serious issues.